Hi, uh, thank you very much to Joe, first of all, for having me to speak here. And uh, I'm delighted to be here, and it was a very interesting contribution I think we heard there. Just when I was coming into this room down the back, there's a very interesting collection of books. And one of them is about Tip O'Neill, whose grandmother hails from these parts. And he spoke about when he was Speaker of the House of Representatives, making it a far more effective, more open and more imaginative place. And he said, you can teach old dogs, you can teach old dogs new tricks, but the old dogs have to be willing to learn new tricks. And it struck me that that is uh, sort of tallies in some way with what we are discussing here today, because we're discussing the political fragmentation that was the result of an inconclusive election. And what I'd like to argue is that rather than harking back to the days of strong majority uh, governments or a stronger executive, I think we should uh, be embracing this so-called new politics and our politicians should be embracing uh, new tricks that come with new politics. Uh, just to start with, I'm going to look at how we got here. Uh, 2000 election, 2016 was an election that nobody really won. Uh, and it led to a government that nobody really wanted, least of all its participants, because there was very, really little in it strategically in the long run for the two main parties, except for, as the saying goes about old age, it was better than the alternative. And the alternative would have been another election, which, which, which would have left them, I think, in the same dilemma all over again. And just looking back at why we have this political fragmentation that we have today, I think the question should not be why we were left with this arrangement, but why maybe it didn't happen sooner. I think on closer examination, this uh, current Thal arrangement was a long time coming. In some ways, the, it was a political development that was hidden in plain sight. And there were two phases, if you like, to the sort of upheaval that was wrought on the political system as a result of the economic crash. And the first was 2011, which resulted in the huge collapse of Fianna Fáil and the biggest ever clear out of the Dáil with two thirds of TDs losing their seats. The second phase was the election of 2016, which had almost as dramatic results with the outgoing government being punished to precisely the same seat number as Fianna Fáil had been five years previously. So what replaced that was the most fragmented Dáil in the history of the state. There was the rise of Sinn Féin, uh, which was more steady than sudden. There was the formation of a number of smaller parties, uh, like Social Democrats, and there was the assertiveness over the, author over the austerity years of what had previously been considered uh, sort of fringe left-wing parties uh, who grew mo mostly out of the Irish water movement and they significantly increased their numbers in the Dáil as well as the rise of independence. And I think in some ways Ireland was ahead of the curve in terms of what looked like a sort of anti-establishment uh, backlash that uh, was to follow globally, if you like. It looked to us at the time like a very unique political upheaval, but uh, I would argue that what's happened in the world since then suggests that far from having a very unstable political system here, Ireland is like a, you know, a san sanctity of political stability in an uh, unstable world, and we only need to look at our nearest neighbours to know what political instability uh, really looks like. Uh, I would also argue that, um, you know, while maybe the rest of the world is sort of uh, tearing up the political rule book in Ireland, what we're simply doing is rewriting our, our script on politics. Um, we, what happened, I think, was less a result of voter volatility and an anti-establishment backlash. I think it was more the natural outcome of a proportionate representation electoral system. So in other countries that have that voting system, it has long been the case that they have had multi-party governments uh, where policies are formed by cross-party alliances and consensus in the parliament. So I think new politics, as we call it here, is a more natural outcome of our voting system. Um, and over the years in Ireland, that natural outcome was sort of skewed, if you like, because there was a strong historic attachment to the two main parties that meant that, you know, we were something of our own special case. That all changed with the collapse of Fine Fáil and the subsequent big drop in seat numbers for Fine Gael in 2016. Um, those events were not, I don't think, as dramatic a shift in the political landscape as 
they might have appeared or as we might have analysed them to have been. I think they were both the result of the foundations of both those parties uh, subsiding over the years. So, for example, in the 1970s, uh, you, you know, when my parents were my age, 65% of Irish voters identified with a political party, either through their family or socially. So, in other words, people voted for how their people might have voted for. Um, that attachment declined significantly. It was 40% in the 80s, and that's when the transition was made from single party to coalition governments. And then by the uh, millennium, uh, just 25% of people uh, identified in Ireland with a political party. So I think once the party attachment were off, short-term factors like economic and social developments uh, kept Fine, Fine Fáil in place from 97 to 2011. Uh, when their vote collapsed, it transferred easily to Fine Gael. Um, but I think our political fragmentation that we're now seeing is the result of a long-term trend resulting from a combination of decline of party attachment as well as the more natural consequence of proportionate representation system. So the current all is part of a transition I think that we're going through and I think that's relevant uh, because of what it means will happen at the next election. So that brings me to how our politicians are dealing with this new sort of fragmented political system and what it has meant for government and for governance. So in Ireland, we came up with this very Irish euphemism that we call new politics. It was uh, sold to us as this very novel approach, sort of like what they do in Nordic countries, where policy making is based on consensus between parties who you know, would sit down together and very sensibly thrash out policies in the best interest of the people. I think at the start, what we got was a bit more Ballymagash than Borgen, the most ineffectual parliament to get to take off with in the history of the state in the sense of legislating. In the first two years of this thaw, we got a third of the uh, laws that we would have got in uh, comparable parliamentary years. I think the Dáil was slow to address very serious problems, you know, such as health and housing, because uh, uh, it wasn't in the interest of the government or Fianna Fáil which was sort of taking the place of a de facto minority partner, to do anything that might prove to be a big political flashpoint in case they risked causing an election. But having said that, I think there is great grounds to have faith in this system, and I think it has shown signs more recently of delivering. Uh, one example that I might just give is the law that we had on the digital age of consent, which the government wanted to set at 13, um, which was essentially the age at which companies like Facebook and Google might own all the information that a young person shared, you know, such as their photos, their text, their parents or friends, and sell it for the purpose of advertising. Now, Fianna Fáil and Labour joined forces and said this should be 16. They then got Sinn Féin on board and the government's vote to have it at, at, at 13 was defeated. So the opposition went out in that case. And I think that is exactly what was promised with new politics. You know, parties working together across the divide to ensure that the doll wasn't just a rubber stamp um, of government decisions, that laws would be more considered um, before, they come, before they're passed. Uh, I also think that the greater plurality of voices that we now have in the Dáil is, is resulting in issues that might not have previously got an airing being, um, being heard. You know, I think the referendum to repeal the Eighth Amendment, which is going to be discussed here later today, might not have come to pass if there was a strong government majority. You know, after all, this is an issue that had been kicked down the road for years by government. But it was put on the table in the Dáil quite strongly by Claire Daly and Ruth Coppinger. Um, it was the independent minister at Cabinet, Catherine Zappone, who also pushed for it. And then it was Fianna Fáil's uh, Billy Keller who, who tabled the proposal that ultimately was put to the people to have a vote on uh, terminations without limits up to 12 weeks gestation. I think also you could argue that the, 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 the approach to Brexit, where Fianna Fáil is taking a more... Um, conciliatory approach, uh, you know, sort of in the national interest um, rather than, you know, kicking the government for the sake of it, that wouldn't have come out, come across, uh, come about only for the, the current arrangement that we have. The arrangement has also led to the big transfer of power from the executive to parliament. 
And I think that is leading to greater accountability overall and greater governance. You know, we just need to compare it to what went before it, which was the Fine Gael Labour, which had the, the greatest majority in the history of the state. And that government came into office promising not just to fix the economy, but to fix the broken political system that had failed us and had, that had led to the economic and financial crash. But I think that was a missed opportunity. We slipped back into the cycle cycle of scandal that the country had become used to. But I think under the current um, doll, we, because of the more deliberate process that the government has to go through, it's less inclined to um, you know, fall into these sort of scandals. Um, so where to from here? Are we going to have another confidence and supply or not? Uh, I think I was one of the people who predicted that it would be, um, to coin a phrase, a temporary little arrangement, something that would keep things ticking over maybe until something better came along and until the voters made their minds up more clearly about what they wanted. Um, only the results of the next election really will tell us if that is to be the case. I think from this vantage point it's very hard to predict, particularly you know, in the age when the electorate is far more volatile and in less forgiving mood. We only need to look to, our, to, to the UK to, to know that. But also here, I think it's worth noting that the, um, the, the, the rate of volatility in Irish elections in modern times, because in 2016, uh, election, just 56% of people voted the same way as they had voted in 2011. And in 2011, just 52% voted how they'd voted in 2007. So around half of voters don't vote the same way as they did last time around. I think there's a couple of ways of avoiding uh, a repeat of this competence and supply arrangement. The first would be for Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael to get a majority of 80 seats, or Sinn Féin for that matter. I don't think that's going to happen. Those days are gone, I believe. The more likely outcome, I think, is, and what both Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael will be hoping for, is that they can build enough alliances with other smaller groups to get them near the magic number of 80 seats to form a majority. And a lot of that will depend on whether Fine Gael, I think, can build, an, build up you know, a head of steam on, on, on their current popularity. But I think that will also be a big ask, given that the groupings in the Dáil are quite small, so you'd be depending on a lot of different groups to reach the 80 number. And also a lot of groups wanted to stay out of the government formation process last time around. So they're probably likely to do that again. And that leaves the reliance on either Sinn Féin to form a government, which um, I think both Fine Gael and Fine Gael uh, and Fianna Fáil have been ruling out, or there is the grand coalition option, which I don't think would be in the long-term strategic interest of either party. So I think when all that is considered, what we're really left with is the default position of another confidence and supply agreement or some party forming a minority government that will rely to some degree on the support of the other side. So uh, how will that work? Well, it's another confidence and supply or maybe a different version of confidence and supply. Um, so I think that's something better that the both parties have been waiting for isn't likely to come along. What we're going to get instead is not politics as we previously knew it, but maybe and hopefully an improved version on what we now have, maybe new politics, newer. So uh, in conclusion, I think that minority governments with the lengthy periods of government formation, like we saw in 2016, are likely to become a norm uh, as we progress in Irish politics. Irish politics is in transition. I think it's moving away from the Westminster model of parliament to becoming more traditionally European in terms of the numbers of parties the smaller parties and the complexity of government formation. And I think that is the natural outcome of our proportionate representation system, as well as the demise of uh, party attachment. So minority governments and a more diverse parliament are probably here to stay. Uh, that can mean two things. It can mean dysfunction, it can mean paralysis, it can mean ineffective leadership. It can also mean consensus and more considered policy making in a better parliament with greater oversight of the executive and, as a result, better governance. But I think in order for that to happen, uh, politics, politicians themselves will have to um, mature in the way they do business. And I think the rules of the doll itself will have to change so that we don't see the current situation where 
um, the opposition are tabling um, motions all the time and it's resulted in a legislative uh, backlog. So I think, you know, if, if our current crop of politicians, Leo Radker, Pascal Donoghue, Mary Lou MacDonald and others want to represent the sort of generational change in politics that I think they uh, claim to represent, I think maybe the best way for them to do that is to embrace this new system of so-called new politics. I think it is where the best and greatest potential for good governance in this country lies. And I think, uh, you know, they should embrace the words and spirit of uh, Tip O'Neill, who, um, whose grandmother comes from here, in, in evolving and adapting to a more uh, imaginative, more open and more representative parliament. Thank you. Mm.